Hey, hey, a special This Week in Indiana Football brought to you by Indiana Sports Beat Radio, as always. We are officially deep into the offseason, and the college football offseason in general is obviously off to a start as well. Now that the national championship has been put to rest with Georgia winning their first national title in over 40 years. Again, welcome to this week, Indiana. This week in Indiana football. Excuse me, it's been a while. It's been several weeks actually. And with me, as always, is the great Dustin Shooty from Saturday Tradition, live from. It's not sunny Florida right now, is it, Dustin? But it's fairly decent weather, Florida that you're in. Yeah, well, right now behind me, it's it's moonlight sky, Florida. I guess you could call it, and it's like yeah. High 40s and low 50s or something like that. So I'm still sitting on the patio here in a hoodie, and I might have to grab a beanie and a blanket at some point <laughs> in the podcast. But it's still better than the nine inches of snow and yeah. uh, sub-zero temperatures that a lot of people in the Midwest listening to this podcast are probably dealing with. So I won't I won't complain too much about it being around 50 degrees here. But you've been living it up down there for several weeks, like since Christmas, correct? Yeah, I got here on the 23rd. My parents live in um central florida my mom lives in central florida um and so i've been able to play golf hit up disney plenty of uh, golf yeah uh hit up some breweries and some and some other places around the area so on the 23rd of january we'll fulfill my one month stay and i'll be headed back to kennesaw where they have they're projected to get more snow sometime next kennesaw week, so. georgia so what is that mm-hmm. northern that's north of atlanta right it's north of atlanta it's about a 35 minute drive depending on traffic north of atlanta so yeah i'm uh i moved to the south to get away from the snow and i'll be driving back <laughs> into it next month or next weekend it seems this speaking weekend. of kennesaw before we get into all the indiana football updates and whatnot your kennesaw state owls have been doing fairly solid in conference play correct yeah, three and zero. First three and zero start in uh, program history in in the conference. So I'm fired up about that. I'm a season ticket holder. It's, <laughs> people ask about my affiliation with that. I just I live there and I enjoy uh, basketball. And it's fun to support a, a team that's kind of like an underdog, right? Like they're not on the same level yeah. as Indiana or Purdue or Michigan or Michigan State, at least usually. So it's always fun to just kind of go to those games and show some support. So I don't I didn't go there. I don't have really. For some reason any I thought you went to Kennesaw, but did you go somewhere in Ohio? Is that is that where? No, I went to or, I went to I went to Manchester, which is Manchester. up near Fort Wayne area. And you played tennis. Okay, yep. yeah, but which gives me a in, in college to football. Okay, <laughs> that's right. That's your your slogan catchphrase that you always seem to. I feel like you've introduced yourself in that way before, but. Anyway, we got plenty to talk about. Tons of things have happened since we last talked. We didn't talk directly after the Indiana-Purdue game, which is when Indiana's season obviously ended. And tons has transpired since then. Obviously, the main thing that everybody expected was the firing of Nick Sheridan. Since then, you've also had a couple of other coaching changes. You had recently Charlton Warren, defensive coordinator, get up and leave, followed by the defensive line coach in Kevin Peoples as well. So... A couple things, those two in particular, those last two, Charlton Warren and Kevin Peoples, those are losses that I feel like hurt Indiana a lot more than you would expect them to. I know some people have kind of said Charlton Warren maybe not so much because of the fact that he was only there for one year, but he had so many good recruiting connections in the South and he was already doing a good job at maintaining a class when you were 2-10 and ten, that was obviously one of the top 10 or 15 in the country, so... A couple coaching changes, Dustin. I, I know we've talked a lot about this on Jim Show as well. What stands out to you with that stuff? Yeah, first, the, I mean, the Nick Sheridan stuff was not a surprise. We talked about it all season long, for really from like, I don't know, midway through the season on, that this you couldn't continue to go with Nick Sheridan the way this offense had been operating. I mean, it wasn't just like give him another year and then maybe things get – I mean, it was just so bad. They were the only team yeah. – I think we talked about this. They were the only team – in the Big Ten, or excuse me, in Power Five football, that didn't score a hundred points against conference foes. I mean, even Vanderbilt did that. They play one less game and they play in the SEC, and they didn't. I don't remember what the record was: one and eleven, two and ten. I don't know. So when you factor that in, I mean, there was just no, there was no wiggle room. They had to cut. They had to part ways if Tom Allen wanted to to kind of keep this momentum moving forward. 
Charlton Warren, I agree with what you said in terms of I, I don't know whether that's a big loss in terms of defensive coordinator and developing talent and that sort of thing. Obviously, he's been in the SEC with with places like I think he was at uh, Nebraska even for a little bit. I, he was at mm-hmm. Tennessee, Georgia, Florida. He's had a lot of different stops. Air Force. I think that was Air his only Force. other coordinating position was Air Force. And I, I think – from a defensive coordinator, for, or for, excuse me, from a defensive back, from a development standpoint in the secondary, I think he's probably proven himself on that front. But in terms of a defensive coordinator, we still don't know because I still contest that Indiana's defense was pretty good. They just got worn down by about the seventh or eighth game of the season because they had to be on the field so damn much. Um, but from the recruiting standpoint, I mean, there's no doubt when you have connections to Georgia, Florida, um, those two key states in the recruiting, and, and Tom Allen already has that kind of pipeline there. But to have kind of those those heels dug in and, and a lot of familiarity with that soil and those two really rich recruiting states, I think that's a big loss. Kevin Peoples, same kind of thing, right? He had ties to Louisiana. That's another state that doesn't produce the same kind of talent as a California, Texas, Florida, Georgia, Ohio even, but they've got some good recruits down there. So I think that those two losses are significant in terms of recruiting. I don't know that they're going to be big losses in terms of development, in terms of defensive style. And the thing that I think you can be optimistic about if you're an Indiana fan is the fact that Tom Allen is a defensive minded coach. He can kind of set the framework or or kind of set the boundary as to what he wants to do defensively and then bring in a guy um, that he he wants to mold that kind of defense. He wants somebody to adopt that kind of defensive scheme, right? So I think I think that they're going to be okay, and especially when you look at, and we'll talk about this next, when you look at the hires that they made, especially on the defensive side of the ball with Chad Welk coming in from Minnesota, I, I think that this is an upgrade for I, – I truly think this is going to be an upgrade mm. for Indiana. Yeah, and so getting into that, you have the three – or. Three new coaches, two new coordinators. You got Walt Bell on the offensive side of things, which has raised a lot of question marks, not so much negative or positive. I mean, there's a lot of things that I think people, with Walt Bell in particular, that they're trying to keep in the shadows right now because they want to keep the optimism up. Because honestly, when you look at Walt Bell, it I mean, it's not great. I mean, obviously, it's head coaching tenure at UMass is what sticks out the most. Um, he had stints at Florida State with Willie Taggart, which is kind of the Tom Allen connection. Uh, before that, he was with Maryland and, and DJ Durkin, which is a coaching staff that I think had tons of issues. And, and his, I, I know he got in trouble, DJ DJ Durkin. I can't specifically remember what all entailed with that situation, but I know that that was kind of a sticky mess up in Maryland. And then you got Chad Wilt, like you said. It's somebody who I didn't really know anything about necessarily. I don't necessarily always dive deep into each of the Big Ten's coaching staffs, but when you look at what defensive, well, now defensive coordinator Chad Wilt, but former defensive line coach Chad Wilt did in Minnesota in previous stops, I mean, he he cre- he built a, a fantastic line with Minnesota this past season. But one thing that really sticks out to me, and Jim pointed out to me on uh, on his show, he's only ever coached defensive line, which is very interesting because he comes into this defensive coordinator position in Indiana, he's going to be coaching linebackers. And – it's, I'm not saying it can't work because obviously it can. I mean, I'm not saying it will or it won't, but it's definitely an odd thing that he wouldn't have been the defensive coordinator and the defensive line coach, but instead he's the linebackers coach. Yeah, and again, I think that probably comes down to what Tom Allen maybe wants to do schematically. Um, it is going to be interesting because when you look at what they were able to do, and look, he could be there could be a specific defensive line coach, and then there could also be Chad Wilt, you know, maybe a, an assistant defensive line coach in that kind of role with the That's defensive true. corner position, kind of looking over all that stuff. But when you look at what Minnesota, I mean, Minnesota was probably the most underrated defensive team in the Big Ten, maybe even in the country this season. When you looked at what they were able to do, they weren't overly flashy. They didn't get a ton of sacks. They didn't get a ton of tackles for loss. They were just really disciplined. They tackled. They brought runners to the ground. They they defended the pass extremely well. They didn't force a lot of turnovers. And I think that that's what maybe Tom Allen wants to get back to, getting guys to the ground. You don't have to be sexy defensively, especially in the Big Ten, to win games. Now you go back to 2020. That's what, I mean, they were flash and sizzle, right? Indiana was intercepting. They were forcing fumbles. They were getting to the, they were getting to the quarterback. They were doing a really good job 
of a lot of the things that, you know, basically what Iowa was able to do and why they were able to get to the Big Ten championship game this year. I don't think that that's what Chad Welt brings to Indiana, but I think what he does bring is look at what they did with Boye Mafe, Niles Pinckney, Thomas Rush, some of those guys up front. Um, Azizi, I'm going to butcher the name, Azizi Otomiwo. Um, Minnesota it, has quite the cast of characters on their team, I will say. They, they do have some great names. I will give them that. But he was able to get that group of guys. They weren't, again, they weren't overly flashy. It wasn't like they were getting six sacks a game. But you watched that West Virginia game. They were dominating the line of scrimmage. West Virginia struggled to run the football. They were, Minnesota finished number two in run defense. I think they were number two in overall defense and maybe third in scoring defense. Like, this is a good defensive team. And I think it all comes down to fundamentals. P.J. Fleck is one of the best coaches in the Big Ten, along with Kirk Ferentz and, and Paul Christ at perfecting the fundamentals. And I think that that's what Chad Welt brings on the defensive side. So that's why I say it's going to be an upgrade. I don't expect this to be a team that's going to get 25 interceptions or um, is going to rack up 50 sacks. But I think that they're going to be able to get guys to the ground. They're going to be able to keep the ball out of the hands of opposing playmakers, maybe even better than probably what they did this past season. On the offensive side, Walt Bell, I have a lot of questions. I think Indiana could have hired a made a better hire, but what I always remember is look at Will Muschamp down at the SEC. He's had stops at Florida. He's had stops at South Carolina. As a head coach, it didn't work out, but his defenses when he's been the defensive coordinator at Auburn, um, some of these other places, LSU won a national championship. I mean, he's been outstanding as a defensive coordinator. So sometimes you're better off in an offensive coordinator role. My biggest concern, though, is when you look at some of those Maryland teams and, and some of the offensive flash that they had when he was there, look at their recruiting rankings. They had some really flashy players. They had some really good um, – and, of course, this has been five, six years ago now, so, of course, all the names that I can try to think of uh, are – Steph- Stephon Moody. Diggs, I believe, is the one who comes to my head. I don't know if yeah. Walt Bell was coordinating him or not. but I don't remember um, – Ty, I think Ty Isaac is his name. He was a really good running back. They had a couple of really good running backs, some explosive wide receivers. They had playmakers. I don't know about Indiana having that same level of playmaker. So even though it's Maryland, I think that Maryland's recruiting up there during that time was really good. They had some really good skill position players. So I do question what he's going to be able to do with this Indiana offense, considering how terrible it was last season. Yeah, I mean, you're essentially going from what you had two seasons ago. You had what happened in 2020, 2021, excuse me. And now you're really rebuilding. Michael Penix is off to Washington with Kalen DeBoer and Nick Sheridan, obviously. Um, but are you going to use Donovan McCulley? You obviously, you've, you've lost uh, Peyton Hendershot at tight end, who is also a great pass catcher. Uh, Ty Freifogel's gone. I mean, who ended up having a big down 2021 season, but he was a great playmaker previously. So, it's, it's going to be a complete rebuild for the Indiana office. It doesn't mean it can't be good, but Walt Bell's going to have to make several decisions, important decisions early on, if he's going to want to get this offense back on track. He may be able to do that. We don't know. Obviously, it's gonna, the, the first thing is going to be coming down to if he can make the right decision at who starts at quarter, quarterback because you don't want to make – you don't want to go through what you did last year and keep shuffling through Jack Tuttle and Don McCulley and as right. far down the, the depth chart as Grant Grimmel. Uh, and, but that goes into kind of my next thing. You do have transfer quarterback uh, Connor Basilak from Missouri. I really hope to God I said that name right. I didn't do a pronunciation check before I, I did this. But I do know that our boy, our new uh, quarterback or potential quarterback, Connor Bazelak had a fantastic couple of years with the Tigers in the SEC. 16 touchdowns this past season against 11 interceptions. I mean, that's it's kind of along the lines of what you expect for somebody to be able to, I guess, be at a, a school like Indiana in the Big Ten, especially whenever you've had people in the past like Richard Lego. He was a great, he was a great uh, just through the air kind of a quarterback, but he threw a lot of interceptions. Maybe this will be the kind, the same kind of uh, player that you get in Connor Bazelak. Like, I'm not too sure. Dustin, I'm not sure how much you've seen of him since you obviously cover the Big Ten and not the SEC, but this could be a good pickup for Indiana, and we'll have to see, obviously. Yeah, for me, it's it's wait and see, um, and most of that is because, as you mentioned, I don't. I mean, I don't watch a lot of SEC football. Um, 
unless they're playing a Big Ten team or unless it's the postseason. It's just, you know, the nature of my job. I try to watch as much college football as I can, but at the same time, a lot of those games are going on. Um, so I don't know too much about him. I know that his touchdown interception ratio is not great. I know his completion percentage is really good, so that's a that's a promising sign. Um, but look, th- th- there's going to be a lot of moving parts here. Um, I-, I don't know – He's going to come in and probably be projected to be the number one starter. I do think he's an upgrade from probably anybody else that Indiana has on its roster. Uh, I think he's probably even an upgrade from Michael Penix, uh, maybe even from a health standpoint. I, I just yeah. I don't think it can be any worse. So I think that it's going to be an upgrade from what we saw last year. A lot of that depends on health. But again, there's a lot of moving parts. Walt Bell's the new offensive coordinator. You've got a new quarterback. You're going to have to, you know, work with some new wide receivers and some moving parts on the offensive line. And, you know, who's going to be in the running back room and, and who's going to be, you know, the transfer portal kind of changes this game. So we have a whole lot yeah. of, we'll find out more about, what this team can do in spring practice. But I do think in terms of when you look at the statistical, when you look at the experience he brings from Missouri playing against some pretty good competition in the SEC, I do think it's a positive thing. I think it's an upgrade and the number one key for him. And it's been the, the the curse for Indiana for the past several years. Now he's got to be able to stay healthy. Otherwise it, it does, you no good. Yeah. And obviously that starts up front with the offensive line, which we didn't see a change in the offensive line coach and Darren Hiller, which is, I would say, after Nick Sheridan was the most anticipated thing to happen in the offseason from in terms of getting things right and fixed and, and what you wanted to change. And maybe Tom Allen just thought that it was a fluke from Darren Hiller because it's, it's not like his offensive lines over his entire career have been horrendous. Last year just stands out a lot because of what happened, obviously, that you, you were – shuffling through so many different guys because of injuries you couldn't get anything going the run game was horrible so i mean we'll have to see obviously if this is another bad season for darren hiller it'll be he'll he'll be gone next obviously i mean i don't think tom allen's the kind of guy to do a mid-season firing but we're not going to get into that kind of well, stuff well, right now but let me let me weigh in on that just a little bit because i think sure. what you have to understand with the way Kalen DeBoer's offense worked is it's not a power rushing attack, right? So you're not going to see the same sort of lineman at Indiana, at least when he was in charge and then when it carried over to Nick Sheridan. It's not the same sort of offensive line set that you would mindset that you would see from Iowa, Wisconsin, maybe yeah. even Ohio State, Michigan. This is more of a finesse. This is we need guys to be able to be quick on their feet, to pick up quick blocks, to be able to pass block because most of it was an extension of the run game. Uh, so that's why that's why this team averaged 3.3 yards or whatever it was against Idaho when it was rushing. They just don't have a power attack. So I don't know that that's on um, the offensive line coach. I think that's more on a schematic recruiting development type of thing. And now that you bring in a new offensive coordinator, maybe that changes things a little bit. I, I just think it maybe this is – an issue with who's coaching the offensive line. Maybe it's not, but I think it had more to do with scheme and personnel than it did actual development. And maybe that's why you didn't see a change or at least haven't seen a change just yet. Yeah. And that's a good point. That's what I say. Everybody likes to throw everything on just what they see. They don't necessarily think of those kinds of things all the time. So we'll have to see, obviously if Darren Hiller's able or if this new scheme per se is able to change things and people won't even talk about it anymore. They'll just move right. on and it'll be it'll be something that happened in the past. So moving on to our next thing. And this is this is kind of some old news, but I'd like to get your perspective on it. But at the end of the season, the transfer portal is always a huge topic now that we have that implemented into college sports. And there's no intra-conference ruling. You can go anywhere you want. You don't have to sit out anywhere. And one of the biggest topics of conversation after the end of the season, specifically after the old Oak and Bucket game you had your third Indiana player jump in the portal and likewise go to Jeff Brom's Purdue Boilermakers. I don't understand what it is with, and I know it's only three guys and most of your portal players are going elsewhere, but it just, for some reason for me, it it makes it feel like that does the rivalry really mean anything for one and two, when you're going to your rival, you have all sorts of information that now three players can yeah. give to 
to the opposing head coaches that just any, just because you've been with them for so long with a guy like Reese Taylor, who is not only just a contributor, he was one of the starters next to Taiwan Mullen. You can exploit those things because you were right by him throughout your entire career. So I don't understand why those things are allowed to happen. I feel like down the road, we're going to see some changes to this transfer portal, especially with the, how crazy it already is. Um, I do believe that the base component of it, of you being able to go once, will be will always be there. But I think there will be some restrictions, like kind of like I was saying in the beginning, intra-conference transferring and that kind of thing. Because you play those opponents every single season, for the most part, if they're in your division. But if you're going to, I don't know, like, you know, say Missouri, because we had Connor Basilak. Uh, if you're going to someone in a different conference, you're more than likely, Missouri's more than likely not going to be playing Indiana in the next three or four years, unless we have some sort of schedule mishap and you have to schedule somebody else at the last second, which at that point doesn't really matter. But I'll get off my soapbox with this and let and let you share your thoughts. Well, the point that you bring up, it used to be that way. Um, it used to be you couldn't transfer in conference, and if you did, you had to get approval basically from the previous head coach to sign off on it. And that was kind of your that was kind of the logic, right? I don't want to develop somebody for two, three, four years and then see him go. Um, you know, with our playbook, basically, and be able to be an inside source, even if he's not playing at the next program. Uh, and then that changed a few years ago with this introduction of the transfer portal. And each conference made the made a the decision to do it. It was a that wasn't an NCAA thing or a college football thing. That was a conference by conference thing. Now I don't know if we'll ever see anything, you know, revert back to the old ways. But uh, I think there would probably be some people that would be in favor of that, at least in terms of maybe the same division or if there's a rivalry game. Indiana is not the only one to be dealing with this. We've seen some guys transfer from, uh, I think, Michigan State to Michigan and vice versa, Michigan to Michigan State. It's happened. Um, I think that there's been – I don't know about the Iron Bowl, Auburn and Alabama. I'm, I'm, I don't know – if there's been some sort of those rivalry, um, Cade Mays, I believe, transferred from Georgia to uh, Tennessee or Tennessee to Georgia, something like that. Um, uh, an offensive lineman, he was a heavily uh, recruited offensive lineman who made that transfer. So I think that in this game now, it's not as big of a deal. Um, the other thing that I keep thinking about in terms of Purdue and Indiana is I remember at the end of the season, before those two teams played, Tom Allen and Jeff Brom kind of complimented each other, said how much they appreciated one another and how much they respected <laughs> each other. Um, I'm sure he really appreciates the players he's getting. Well, I, I, I just think that it's a rivalry with respect. It's not kind of the same hatred that you might get in the Iron Bowl. It's not the same sort of hatred you see with Ohio State and Michigan. It's just – it's not there. This is Purdue-Indiana football, right? Like – it's a it's a rivalry game for the fans, but a lot of the in-state players they know each other. That's why, like Demar J. Lewis, Samson James, uh, Reese Taylor, a lot of these guys know each other on the Purdue and Indiana rosters, right? So, I just don't think it's as big of a deal anymore with the technology that we have with these guys going to camps with each other. I mean, it, it's just not as big of a deal. I, I know people hate to hear that, but I, I don't know what else to say. And I think that's that's less of the aspect of it than than the um, the the you know the, the having the playbook and that kind of stuff. That's what bothers me more because you have genuine information that could give the other team an advantage. And it doesn't even have to be Purdue. It can be Michigan. It can be Northwestern. It can be Nebraska. Whatever it may be, because you play those teams frequently, specifically in your division. But we'll put that to bed. Just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, another thing. Last I think it was last week or two weeks ago, one or the other, we had the uh, Big Ten rescheduling uh, for the conference games for, I think, the second season in a row. And this bothers me for a, a couple of reasons, and I'm going to try to gather my thoughts correctly so I'm not just rambling. But uh, one of them, they all they definitely favor specific teams in this. It, it doesn't matter. I don't even have to say who it is. You know which team – which specific team that the Big Ten is going to try to help out in this kind of a manner. They say it's because they don't want teams playing at home or away for for multi or two back-to-back -to -back seasons, whatever it may be. I get that part of it. But whenever they're reformulating that kind of thing, they're trying to figure out how they can help who they think their best team is going to be get to the college football playoff because they have that excuse now. 
because of what what the uh, their ruling is with playing teams at the same stadium for back to back seasons is they can go and manipulate their own schedule based on what they think personnel is going to be like next season, and that's one thing that bothers me. Second thing that bothers me is that. They're just going to be able to keep doing this for the next several years, I feel like, because they plan Big Ten schedules out for like until 2024 or 25. So yeah, I think, what's I think the, currently what's, it's 2025. So what's stopping them from waiting until, you know, this time again next January, we see another new Big Ten schedule? I personally believe that they should do this every two years. Um that's just the way – because it gives you something to talk about. Like, I think the <laughs> SEC does it every year, right? And I think the Big Ten – Yeah, they release new scheduling every year, and it's, it's – Well, it's you're really saying – so they, they, they change the schedule or they release the new schedule? They release the new schedule. So if I okay. was the Big Ten, and when this – when this – that's not really a contract, but whenever this cycle is up, what I would do is I would do this every two years, and you could do – something where, okay, these are going to be, you know, let's just use Indiana as, as an example. These are their three crossover games. You know, they're going to play Iowa, they're going to play Illinois, and they're going to play Purdue. Um, and then every, you know, so then they'll play a home and home with those two schools. And then the next in, let's say 2025. So then in 2027, they re-release a new schedule and basically release the dates. They release the crossover opponents. I think that would be great television. I don't think you need to do it every year. Uh, I think you could do it every two years. It'd be good television, gives us something to talk about. But, you know, there's no question that there was, I don't want to say it was an agenda, but at the same time, I mean, you look at the changes that they made, and I understand the scheduling, the flip-flopping of stadiums because some of that got messed up and and scheduling was an issue with the 2020 season, but uh, you went from having Penn or excuse me, Ohio state open the season with road games against Michigan state and Penn state. And all of a sudden they play Wisconsin and Rutgers at home and they open the season with five straight home games. <laughs> and look, people can get mad about this um, and you can view it any way you want. I do think that the big 10 is probably protecting Ohio state as much as they can. At the same time, look at the SEC. They do the same thing with Alabama. How many times has Alabama played Georgia in the regular season? You go back and look at the Steve Spurrier years when he was at South Carolina. Look at how many times Alabama played South Carolina in the regular season. I mean, these commissioners and, and these decision makers aren't stupid. Um, and at the end of the day, Ohio State still has to go out and win those games. Doesn't matter what the schedule says. Doesn't matter when you play who or, or where the game's at. Ohio State still has to go out and win it. So it doesn't do them any good to try to quote unquote protect them if they don't win those games. But I do think that in on some level these commissioners have those teams' interest and their financial uh, interest in mind. And I mean. It is what it is. I you, I can't fault them for making a business decision. I understand why it might be frustrating to the fans, but if you don't like it, then maybe your team needs to rise to the top and, and take well, see, that's the game. <laughs> see, that's the problem, though, that college football, it's not – I understand that there is a business aspect to it. There's money involved. There's television contracts. There's all sorts of stuff. But at its base component, it's collegiate football. It's still amateur athletics. I know it's kind of semi-amateur at this point with NIL deals and players making money and all sorts of things like that. But at the same time, this isn't this is not the professional ranks. You should not be pushing. It's not like the NFL where eventually somebody's going to want the Cowboys to come out on top or something crazy like that. You can't just push for your your name. In my opinion, you shouldn't be able to just push for whatever brand you think is going to help college football or Big Ten football or SEC football the most because at that point, it's not college athletics anymore. It's just what? how many views can we make Michigan and Ohio State next year or something like that. Right. Well, I mean, you look at the schedule now, October 29th. I don't know what it was before because I don't have it in front of me. Um, but now that that weekend has Michigan, Michigan State and Ohio State, Penn State. I mean, the Big Ten is going to clean up that weekend in terms of viewership. Those are going to be the two highest rated games because one of them, one of them is probably going to be the Fox Big Noon kickoff game. And the other one's probably going to be the ABC primetime game. Um, it's smart business. I mean, pick your poison. You, you, you want to be on I Big mean, Noon exactly. kickoff or college game day. Exactly. And and there were multiple instances. Look at the Big Ten this year. I mean, there were multiple instances where there was the Fox Big Noon kickoff and college game day were at the same game. I mean, 
people what people don't realize is yes it, in the SEC there's probably better football being played in terms of who's at the top I don't think the you can probably make the argument the SEC was better than the Big Ten this year but I mean it's close it's not this wide gap that everybody thinks it is that's number one but Big Ten draws eyeballs it usually has three of the top five most viewed games uh in terms of of total viewership it the attendance is always the best because it has the biggest stadiums so i don't again that's why i don't have a problem with any of this because the big 10 right now before the sec expanded and added oklahoma and texas was basically boat racing these other conferences in terms of financial revenue and the amount of money they could give each school because of what they were drawing in in terms of attendance in terms of uh of television money and some of these other avenues that they go down so again it's interesting to see with the changes they made i i get why fans are upset about some of the stuff some of the changes i i'm not going to fault them because they for the most part they know what they're doing and just to be specific with Indiana, I don't know if you remember, but one of the last episodes we did, I went through uh, the first six or seven games of Indiana's 2022 schedule. And obviously compared to 2021, I was like, this is a lot more manageable because you started off the season at home with Northwestern. Your three non-conference games are the same, Idaho, Western Kentucky, and then at Cincinnati. And then your next three Big Ten games were, and I don't remember the specific order, Maryland, Rutgers, and Nebraska, with I believe two of those being at home. Instead, you have you've traded out Northwestern for Illinois. That's at home still. That's, in my opinion, not too much of a difference. I do feel like it's still an opponent upgrade. It's not like you're going from Northwestern to Wisconsin or something like that, though. But I do believe it's still more of Illinois is still more of a program with an upward trajectory at the moment. And then after the the three non conference games, instead of either Maryland or Rutgers at home, like I believe it was supposed to have been, you're traveling to Nebraska which I do – I keep saying – I wish I had it right in front of me so I could say for sure. But I do believe Nebraska was supposed to be a home game last season as well. Maryland and Rutgers always flip-flop, so I know one of those is always home, one of those away. That doesn't change. And then the order of it is obviously different. They've also stuck Michigan in as the sixth game. That is a home one for Indiana, though, as well. So things shifted around at the top. It's not – and it was never a cakewalk. When you're two and ten the previous season, nothing's a cakewalk. You're building upon all of the issues you had from last season. But I would say it's an average schedule in terms of difficulty. I mean, you have, I would say at the moment, when you look at the first four, those are I would say would winnable. You have Maryland and Rutgers, which would be winnable. Um, Nebraska. We all know about Nebraska. Once again, wins the off season for the eighth season in a row off-season national champions with whatever they've been doing. But, I mean, we don't know how good Nebraska is going to be. But it's on the road. It's the uh, the battle for Chucky the doll, whatever That's we're right. going to end up calling that fake rivalry. But I, I'm definitely looking forward to it no matter where the game's played. But that's just what – it's it's aggravating, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna express any more emotion about it specifically. I just had to get that off my chest in general, whether it affects Indiana or some other school, because I obviously mentioned the main issue isn't what they did to Indiana. It's what they did to favor a specific team. But, but this is, this is exactly why they should do it. And it, whether it's every year or every other year, this is exactly why they need to do it because it gets people talking. It gives something people, it gives people something to talk about during the off season, during this little bit of a lull. And I know that there's really no off season. I can tell you doing this job, once the transfer portal um, you know, went into full effect. There is no off season, um, <laughs> but but now you have. I mean, you have the transfer portal. You have you still have a recruiting period in February. You you have then spring football in March. I mean, there is if you want to bridge that gap and have people talking about college football all the time, release that schedule in about the same time, mid to late January. Let that bleed then into the. Um, the national signing day, which isn't as relevant as it is, but it's still something to talk about in terms of recruiting. And then basically, bam, once that's done, teams are typically starting their spring football in late February or early March. And then that leads over to April or May. Then you have your two summer months and it's time for the next season. So it's a good way to keep people talking about college football for nine or 10 months out of the year. You've got to get rid of the current schedule. So if you're, I, I agree. I like the reveal, the whole reveal aspect of it. But you can't just sit there on the schedules that you have 
and then all of a sudden say, okay, we're going to make changes. I would say if you're going to do that, say you're going to do that at the beginning of, I don't know, sometime during this offseason, probably closer towards the beginning of 2020, the 2022 kickoff, but just wipe the slates clean to say, all right, COVID's done. We're not going to be dealing with all these cancellations or pauses anymore. I'm not saying that that's going to happen for sure, but the, that's hopefully the trajectory that we're on. Well, you know but what I would the, do? This is how I what? would do it, and not to stick on this, but what I would do is why you could reevaluate it every year, every two years, is think about this. You could look at the previous – it's kind of like they do the ACC Big Ten Challenge, right? It's based on how teams finished usually the year before. Now, sometimes they'll maneuver and finagle some of that to get better matchups if they can. Like nobody really cares if if Michigan State is playing Wake Forest. Like they'll probably pit like Il- – or not Illinois, they're pretty good, but Northwestern uh, or Minnesota against a Wake Forest, and then they'll save Duke and North Carolina for some of those – teams in the upper Mm. echelon but what they could do in terms of the big 10 in those crossover games is okay how did these three teams you know and then they could go you know what we're going to have indiana play the first or yeah the first team from the west the fourth team from the west and the seventh team from the west or something along those lines or maybe it's two four six or three four you know whatever the case might be so that way it's a more fair and balanced schedule at least from the previous season you can never really forecast it but i can promise you that when you look at the schedule from last year, look at Nebraska is a great example of this from last season. They had to play Ohio State, Michigan, and Michigan State in their crossover games. Like, and you have other teams like Purdue who played Ohio State. That's a bad example because Purdue played Ohio State, Michigan State, and Indiana. Regardless, you have some teams <laughs> that might play Maryland and Rutgers, and then maybe they but play you could Penn. look at Purdue's upcoming schedule because yeah. okay, they, yes, a lot of people you. think Purdue has. I don't want to say a cakewalk. I hate using that term. Maryland, they play Maryland, Indiana, and Penn State. So none of the top three teams from the Big Ten East this past season. Yeah, from this past season. Right. So that's by the way, that reminds me of that old take. Do you remember? And this is silly, but it was one of the SEC guys saying that Penn State wouldn't finish in the top five. They wouldn't be fifth in the SEC East, but they ended up kind of having a so-so year in the Big Ten East or SEC West. Excuse me. Yep. That was that kind of happen. a random thought that popped into I, my I, I kind of ate crow on that one because that turned out to be fairly accurate. Bay, the, and this is not knocking you specifically. This is just how great this team was. But the, the mishap take of the year had to be, at least not not of all of college sports, but on your end uh, of all your predictions and all whatever the things that you release would be putting Michigan State. And, you, and you've said this a million times, but Michigan State being 14th. But – before I before I have you say anything else, I look forward to you putting Indiana at 14th next season just to see what happens after that. Is that what I should do? So people are now, instead of me want, them wanting me to pick them to win, they're going to want me to pick them last. I will. Here's what I'm going to say. I release those, my uh, preseason predictions every year. I don't think one year I've gotten it right. I don't think once. And Not when you once. say right, you mean literally one through 14. I'm sorry. I don't think I've ever picked the winner correctly of either division. Really? So you, on, on years where in Ohio years, State screwed up, you've picked against Ohio State and then vice versa. Maybe there might have been one year where I picked Ohio State to win and they actually did, but I can't remember. I know in for, in my memory, I know maybe 2018 I picked Ohio State to win. I don't remember. I remember in 2019 – I picked Michigan because everybody was high on Michigan and Ohio State was going through those changes. 2020, I picked Penn State, and then they fumbled that after the first two games. And then this past season, I picked Ohio State because I learned my lesson, right? Pick Ohio State, and what happens is Michigan ends up and wins. And <laughs> I know in 2019, I picked Minnesota to win uh, the West. I don't remember who I picked last year, but it certainly wasn't Northwestern. And then this year, I picked Wisconsin to win the West, and Iowa goes. So I'm 0 for 6 in terms of picking the winner of the division the last three years. I'd have to go back and do some research on the previous seasons. Speaking of picking, and I don't want to step on your toes yet, I know I know Biscuit had some issues with some Michigan fans last season. Yeah, he did. Yeah. More like they had issues with Biscuit. That's probably the better, the better way to, to describe that situation, but – 
I'm looking forward to, if, if we go through with this, to doing Biscuit versus Lily Pickums in 2022. This might be a safer space to do that. Yes, we can We can absolutely <laughs> have, a, have, a, have a little uh, a dog. Maybe we can do like a side segment, like five to ten minutes, uh, you know, a second episode where it's just dog picks. Absolutely, yes. And Lily's been getting, in, in the words of my in-law, sister-in-law, chunky. Not chunky, but chunky. <laughs> Chunky. She's 33 pounds now. We, she was eight, six or eight pounds or something when we got her. Obviously, she's almost full grown at this point, being closer to a year old. But she's still a short little thing. She's She has, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of her, Dustin, but she is. Well, yeah, you have sent me one, but now She's like a, she's built like a dachshund, but she has the the body or like, or like the coloration and, and appearance of a German shepherd. Which is one of the yeah. oddest combinations, if that were to be true. We don't know what she actually is, but she's some sort of mutt combination, and that's kind of what we've adopted in our own heads of what she may be. I, I like it. You know, did you rescue her? or? So she, she was a rescue, yes, but she okay. was a puppy when we got her. Right. So, so that's the same thing with Biscuit. I had no idea what he – I still don't really know what he is. Um, but I put a picture out, and somebody said he looks just like our red tick hound. And that's what I have anointed Biscuit as because he looks just like – if you Google a red tick hound, he is. that's exactly what he looks like. So I don't know for sure, but that's okay. – I, I roll with your kind of style. I We just I, – I guess. <laughs> you and I just guess on what the dog is. That's right. Well, we'll see how that goes. Look forward to that in uh, in 2022. Uh, one more thing before we wrap things up, Dustin, and it just kind of came to me. I didn't have it on our list of things to talk about, and this can be quick, but I remember seeing something going around on Twitter yesterday, I think, of ranking, and you don't have to give me your top 14, but give me maybe your top three if you could think of it, your top three Big Ten football coaches you would like to have a drink with. Oh, man, that's tough. This would have been a good thing to do with the uh, the thirty second timer on you for that we did this back would in the have beginning been, of the this show. Is, I mean, boy, this is tough. I would like. Okay, I've made this perfectly clear that I and I, I like all of the fourteen Big Ten head coaches. In my career, we're doing this for eight nine years now. I've only had an issue with one head coach, um, and I'll leave that guy nameless. Okay, um, I was going to ask. No if longer you to leave him nameless. He's, he's no longer in the Big Ten. Um, I kind of figured. I'm running through my head uh, who it could be, but I'll figure that out later. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I only had an issue with one head coach. But, um, gosh, this is a great question. Um, while you're thinking, why – what is it – and maybe this will keep keep you from thinking, but why do people not want to drink with P.J. Fleck? See, I think like I before. would. I, I think, think I, I would, would. too. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not really a big drinker, but I would want to have a beer with him. I think I would. Now, I here's the thing. I think he would. He might steer the conversation. Um, He'd probably start talking about a flat but, earth or, or aliens but, or something ridiculous like that. See, I don't think that. I, I just – this is this is why I say that because P.J. Fleck is so – I don't know if buttoned up is the right word, but he's so he's so focused on football, his team, his players, everything. Um <clears throat> And he's a great dude to talk to. Um, I just want to get him outside of that football setting and just talk to him about life. Like, I think he would be an interesting person to have. Like, I think he would have a ton of stories Um, and he wouldn't shut up about it. And I have no good stories, so I don't (laughs) care. Uh, So I think PJ Fleck is going to be on my list. Um, You know, I know who else isn't on my list. Mel Tucker is going to be on my list, too. Mel Tucker is going to be on my list, too. So that's two of the three. Except for that, for you, it would be a beer and a cigar, I assume, since he's a big cigar man. He's he's got to be drinking whiskey or bourbon or rye or something. <laughs> that ain't that ain't a beer, yeah. I bet so that was not on your list. Is Paul Christ? See, that's another one. I don't know. Think about it. Okay, he's the le- he has to be the least interesting person in the Big Ten, at least in terms of things that he reveals to the public. Correct. And that's why, again, if I'm drinking with him, is he going to open up a little bit? I think he would. So this is why that's so tough, because I can make an argument for all of them, and I can make an argument against all of them. Um, Gosh, I think honorable mentions here would be Kirk Ferentz. (laughs) I bet he'd drink two and fall asleep. Because that's uh, what I do, and I'm 24 years old. Um, 
honorable mention would be Pat Fitzgerald. I think he would be really fun. Um, honorable mention Ryan Day. Honorable mention James Franklin. <laughs> God, I, I, don't I think, would take. I don't think I would want to specifically drink with James Franklin. I it think I could, like I wouldn't I think enjoy his beers. I think I could legitimately have beers with all fourteen, but I think the last one in there. I think I'm going to go Brett Bielema. And so that means you got PJ Fleck, Mel Tucker, and, and Brett, Brett Bielema. Bielema. Okay. I could. Here's the thing, though. If you ask me that question again tomorrow, I'd probably change my answer because I think that there's. I think all fourteen coaches would be interesting. I would say my my by default Tom Allen because I've never talked to Tom Allen in person. I just want to get to know him over something mm-hmm. like that for one. What would it be interesting? I don't know. Some people think, and I'm going to go ahead and I'll just tell this or see what I saw on Twitter from from uh, from Meg from the Nebraska Cornhusker fan base, as you are familiar with, I'm sure. Uh, says Tom Allen would probably stress her out if she had a beer with him. I don't know if that would be the case. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I don't think – see, here's the thing. I don't think Tom Allen would be any different when he drinks as he is regular. Yeah. So he's he's always himself. Like That's why I think – I think that if you got P.J. Fleck away from football, he would have some good stories. He would talk about other things. I think if you got Paul Crist away from the spotlights of the media, he would open up a little bit. I think Mel Tucker is himself all the time, but he's such a cool dude that I just want to hang out with him. Brett Bielema is himself, but he, again, he's one of those guys that like he talks out of the side of his mouth. So he's, you know, he's got a ton of great stories. Like I just, I could find things. The two, this is going to piss off people, but the two, I don't think I would want to have a beer with would be Tom Allen and Jim Harbaugh. Cause I just, I don't, I don't think. Okay. My second one was PJ Fleck and my third was Jim Harbaugh. So I've got two of your nose. It's it's not anything really against their personality. I just don't think that they would change. I think they would be the same person that they are in the meet, like speaking with a reporter on a Thursday afternoon at two o'clock as they are at ten o'clock at night after two or three beers. I just, I just don't think it would be as interesting as those other twelve guys. Even Jeff Brom, I think, if you got him away from the media table, I think he would you know drop some f bombs and tell you some pretty good stories about things that have happened. How many how many beers until Kirk Ferentz is laughing maniacally like he did after the Iowa State win? That's a great question. That would be – I think you could get Kirk into a, a laughing fit at some point. <laughs> that would be fun. All right. Well, I guess – I think it's time to wrap things up on, on that note. So, once again – let me. Where, where's my buttons here? We're losing track of things. Once again, thanks for listening, as always, to those of you who stick with us here on This Week in Indiana Football. We will be back in the spring, around the spring game time. We'll probably wait until after the spring games occur, see where Indiana is after that. Thanks, Dustin, for joining me. As always, we look forward to seeing you on Indiana Sports Beat on Thursdays, your last episode from Florida, am I correct? Correct. With the, with the right. tea time set up right after. The tea time. So you get to brag one more time to Jim about your tea times. I'm sure that'll be a great time. So be sure to check that out every Monday through Friday. And we'll see you next time on this on another episode of This Week in Indiana Football. All right. I think that went really well.